Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Neerja Bharti. I'm a Sloan alum, as well as uh, one of the panel captains for this panel, developing your organization's skill for the digital future. I have a pleasure to introduce Professor George Westerman, um, who is the moderator for this panel. George is a research scientist with the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. His research and teaching focuses on digital technology leadership and innovation. He's also the co-author of several books, including Lead Leading Digital and the Real Business of IT. Please welcome George. Thank you, Nirta. And, and hi, everybody. Thanks for coming down. This is my favorite conference room on this side of campus. It, it's a really neat place, isn't it? You just feel like you got to have a good conversation in this room. Uh, I want to start off just by uh, talking a little bit about what we know about skills gaps uh, from, from the research we've seen. But the real stars here are the panelists. And so what I kind of want to do is start you off with some ideas and then get out of the way and let them talk at that point as we go forward. Um, this question about skills gaps is a really interesting one. You know, as you look in the press, it's a little complicated. So we see, for example, here, CIOs facing a skills gap, I, the gig economy for talent. And we had a really interesting session on the gig economy earlier, whether that's a good or a bad thing. Um, and then, you know, there's certainly an awful lot of really strong opinions saying, yeah, there's a skills gap here. Uh, there's a skills gap apocalypse, right? So this is serious stuff. And yet then equally smart, reputable people say, what skills gap? Right? This isn't really happening. There's a lot of argument, and of course, then it comes back, yeah, the employers are not just whining. There really is a skills gap. So what do we mean by skills gap? How can we think about this problem? You know, the consensus may, it seems to be that there is one out there, um, but maybe it's not all the skills. So how do we think about whether there's a gap there? Uh, this is an economist picture. Uh, it's called the beverage curve. And um, the beverage curve is one of these things that economists know and nobody else cares about. But the way to think about this is in a good economy, you have lots of job openings and low unemployment. And in a bad economy, you have high unemployment and not a lot of job openings. So it rocks back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's just kind of an indicator of where the economy is. Something weird happened, though, around 2009. And you see this curve shifted outward from the origin. What do I mean by that? Here, it means for the same level of an unemployment, we have a lot more job openings. Or for the same number of job openings, we have higher unemployment. There's something weird going on. There's something about the market that's not working to create that gap. Because if the jobs are there, people ought to take them. Okay? So that's one way to think about it. But maybe it's skills. Maybe that's the problem. So David Otter, who was on stage earlier and is one of the smartest guys I know, has done some phenomenal work in this field. Here's what he says has happened to skills and jobs since 1980. Uh, this is ranked from low to high skill jobs. And you see an interesting thing. If you are a middle skilled person, you're kind of out of luck. Right? The high skilled jobs are growing up 25 to 30% higher over this period. The low skilled jobs are actually shrinking. Uh, now why is that? Well, what can computers do really well? What middle skilled people do? Coordinating work processing paper, doing that kind of stuff. Um, but this is just you know, a simple measure of skill, which is okay, high wage, low wage, that kind of thing. How can we look at it a little bit differently? Um, maybe it's college. Maybe college is the skill that we need to have. Um, and what we found here in looking at this research, very interestingly, is first of all, about 80% of the jobs out there don't require a college degree. That's actually pretty good, because over 60% of the people out there don't have a college degree. Okay. Um, you wouldn't know that from being in Boston, but you would uh, anywhere else, right? Uh, but on the other hand, we see that if you have a college degree, there are two kind of premiums that come up. The jobs that require a degree make more money. And if you're a college-educated person in jobs that don't require a degree, you still make more money. So is it, a, is it college or is it something else? And uh, what we think it actually is, is the ability to complete college says something to you about you as a worker. And then there's some more stuff there. Right? But let's go on a little bit more. By the way, employment changed since 2006. You see the only jobs growing? College jobs, right? or, job, or ed college educated people. 
the non-college educated people are not growing at the moment. So just what, let's look at skills a little bit more deeply then. Here's some research we just did last year. We looked across the 900 jobs that the Labor Department tracks. We found seven aspects of skill in the economy. Physical, uh, equipment, which is working with technology. Spatial awareness is like basically being able to, to uh, drive a car, right? Being able to see what's out there and look around. Teamwork's getting along. Perception, this is being able to separate signal from noise. See the bad apples from the good, right? And then we have here supervision and initiative. Uh, initiative is one of those ones, I love that we found it. We weren't expecting it, but it's in there. So what do these mean? If you had these skills in your job, is it good for you or bad for you? What do you think? How many would say that the, 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 the skills that should pay most are um, supervision kind of skills? A few of you? How many would say the, super, the jobs that should pay more have a whole lot of initiative skills in them? That's the working hard stuff, yeah. How many would say that physical should pay you more? Because it's hard work, right? How about teamwork? This idea of get along, right? That should matter, right? Well, here's what the numbers show. These numbers I'm going to show you are based on an average wage. If you have more of each skill in your job, do you make more or less money in there? And what we find that's interesting is supervision. Every unit of supervision in your job makes you more money. Every unit of technology, every unit of initiative makes you more money. Look at the physical jobs. These are standard deviations of jobs. So the more physical your job is, the less money you make. And a lot of that's being protected by minimum wage. It gets low enough. Look at teamwork. We all hire for teamwork. We're not paying for teamwork. Okay. So are these the skills that we're talking about? Um, hard to know. What's interesting also is maybe technology goes with it. Um, we find that, for example, the more, tech, the more technology you use in your job, the, you make even more money in supervision and initiative, which is good news for IT leaders and IT people. But then the plot thickens. Just as we start figuring out this stuff for the economy, then along come the robots. IBM has its answer to the skills gap in big data and analytics. And what's its answer? Replace all the analysts, right? <laughs> Let Watson do it for you. Uh, we have things coming along like the Google car. Last I counted, 29 states, the job that had the most people in it, in 29 states, is driver. What happens when the Google car comes in? Um, Baxter, do you know Baxter? Baxter is infinitely reprogrammable with, by unskilled people. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no vacations, no skill, no, no uh, uh, sorry, no vacations, no uh, sick time. Um, at launch, it was about seven bucks an hour, which is cheaper than a temp. Um, what happens at that point? And now we have other things. If that's the physical work, what about over here, cabbage, uh, they talked about this morning, right? And a very interesting story about what Cabbage does. It's doing loan processing better than loan officers are. And do you know Automated Insights? Anybody, Automated Insights? Check out the sports page, or check out Forbes and Fortune sometime. Automated Insights is writing the more routine articles in papers these days, because it's a pretty much formulaic thing. What about those writers that have lost their jobs there? So we have a little bit of a complicated story on skills and the skills gap. And we got exactly the right people to talk about this in the room. Okay. So our panelists, it's, it's a really phenomenal panel. From the enterprise side, we have Karen Coker, who's the chief learning officer at Cigna. She's responsible for basically all things having to do with skill at Cigna. Uh, Steve Phillips, CIO at Avnet, uh, also one of our finalists in the award program um, this, this year. Gerald Chertavian has a really cool organization, non-traditional ways of finding people and, uh, that have good skills and are hard workers, and he'll talk about that. And Tom Davenport, who's just written a new book, which I, I can recommend highly, I just read it, uh, on how are computers and robots going to live in the future, and what is the future of workers as computers get smarter. Okay. So uh, what I thought I'd do is just open up with some questions. We'll talk among ourselves, and then we'll do some Q&A from the group. 
So Karen, why don't we start, well, sorry, Steve, why don't we start with you because it is the CIO symposium and you're a CIO, right? <laughs> is there a skills gap? And what are you doing about it? So first of all, I think there is a skills gap and maybe I can answer your question from two different angles, okay. if I may. So, so from a general sense, um, when I think of the skills gap in IT, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that come to my mind. So generally, um, we see a shortage of great technical people that have sort of deep engineering or programming understanding and also have great business savvy and communication skills. Um, so that can be a challenge, I think, for many companies, actually, that combination, that, that sort of combination of tech and business sense. Um, and then the other area that's on my mind in a general sense is uh, our new graduates. So, so I worry about as, as, as we sort of plan our organization, as we strategize, look at the skills that we need for the future. Um, one of the things in my mind is, am I getting the very best graduates, new graduates into my organization? Because that, that's a long-term play. And if we don't have the right talent level, that could cause an issue down, down the line. So, so um, but by the way, we have a, a, I'm based in Phoenix. A lot of our IT team is in Phoenix, Arizona. And we've got a great university nearby. It's Arizona State University. They produce a whole bunch of really good engineering and, uh, and IT graduates. But well, Steve, you had also mentioned you're really close to Silicon Valley. We're only 600 miles away from Silicon Valley. And that's, on one hand, that's a long way. <clears throat> on the other hand, when you've got a freshly minted degree, boy, it's, it's like a magnet. It, it, it sucks up resources, Silicon Valley does. And, and you know, passionate as I am about Avnet as a global technology distributor, we don't quite have the coolness. And, and I can't quite afford the compensation that folks, you know, the folks in Silicon Valley do. So what, what do you do about it? How do you find the right people? You mentioned the colleges. What, what other ways are you doing it? So, so from a college perspective, what, what, we realized, what we actually realized a few years ago was, was we weren't tapping into the right sort of graduates. Um, and we realized that as a company, we were actually being a bit lazy about the way we were dealing with, in our case, Arizona State, um, some other universities as well. And we, 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 we put some time in building deeper relationships with the professors, with the faculty there. Um, we're, much, we're much more open on our intern programs. We bring, frankly, more interns in in the summer than we need um, to hire. Um, and we, we're out there sort of marketing ourselves to, to, to the university, to the students at the university. Um, and I still think we've got a way to go, but we, we, we just see that um, you know, we're viewed more positively by the, by, by the students there, and, and hopefully that's going to pay off for us in the long run. Thank you. Karen, how about you? you? You have to look at the whole enterprise. You're in charge of talent for the whole company now. What are you seeing as skills gaps, and how are you addressing those? Sure. So I think, um, first of all, I think Steve uh, did an excellent job divvying it up into really the three kind of buckets of skills. So when you're talking about IT professionals, of course, it's typically the, the true technical skills. Then there's that element which is becoming ever more important, which is the true understanding of the business and all the dynamics of the business. Um, and then lastly, it's the component part that is all about the ability to team, the ability to be empathetic, the ability to truly understand what the customer wants and needs and care about that, um, the, the ability to be like a servant type leader. So it's all of these types of things. And um, what we've found is most challenging is the side of the skills that really are in the middle and then over into that third bucket. So yes, we definitely have trouble, like almost all companies, finding really good pipeline of skilled technicians, uh, people that are you know, highly competent from a technical standpoint. We keep working on that, and it's not to minimize the importance of that, but it is to say that the business acumen or the desire to really understand the business and to be able to connect with others to appreciate and build a business um, is a little bit more difficult. And then the, the part of it that is even more challenging is finding those skills that people need and want to have as it relates to collaboration and teaming, um, the, even the desire to manage or lead. And I think a lot of that is because it's so different um, as we're now moving into you know, a different way of managing and leading. And so as an example, you know, being part of a community is so much different now. The expectation on a person is so much different than what it used to be. Um, and the same thing with leader. You know, if you look at leadership as a network, I think you're, you know, how to lead um, and finding people that are interested in being part of a group that, that leads and makes decisions is just you know, very different than it was um, historically. And so we're finding most of our challenges there and most of our effort to develop is, is focused there. Cool. One of the things we had talked about is you, you found an interesting new way to find some of these skills that are very hard to measure inside. So identifying who's going to be your best leaders and those kinds of things. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, so very quickly, there's, we're, we're really trying to focus on as much as we can at doing talent that's based on hard data or hard science. Um, and so I was telling George you know, a little bit earlier today that um, 
most of us, you know, if you were to ask us who are the influencers in our organization, most of the people that we would name, at least half of those would be incorrect. Um, and most cases, three quarters of those would be incorrect. And that is not meaning that we're not intelligent people, but it is to say that what really is causing somebody to be viewed as an influencer may be very different than what we think of as somebody's characteristics that influence. Um, and so we're using a couple interesting approaches, organizational network analysis to really uncover people that are influencers, people that are connectors and brokers, um, and understand the importance of that, understand their aptitude in that, and how to develop others to be more like that. And then we have another interesting uh, tool set that we're using that helps us to understand the key elements, like those nuances in somebody's tendencies and somebody's characteristics that cause them to be a high performer in a given role or set of responsibilities as compared to others. And, so I'm a big advocate of data wherever possible, and I think that is really the power of, of where the CIO can, uh, can be a sponsor. And you were saying that this new tool is something that we're using in research, but you're using it also. You have people playing video games, and yeah. the video games do a personality test on people for, through a company called NAC. Uh, and so you're using yeah. it, we're using it in research. It's a, it's a really neat idea for getting at grit and creativity and some of these other things that you might, might not get at other ways. Yeah, absolutely. So, Gerald, let me, let's go over to you now. You know, we're hearing a lot about college graduates as a source. Uh, we're talking, hearing a lot about your internal people and figuring out how the right people. You got a different approach to generating talent and finding it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, start by saying that just when you think about the skills gap, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. We have more of a market failure rather than a skills gap. Mm -hmm. We're fishing in a small pond if you look at college graduates. And, and we say the word college, it's actually a misnomer. I mean, you're referring to four-year four -year college graduates, which is a, a subset, in fact, minority, obviously, of the folks going to post-secondary education in this country. But it per, kind of perpetuates of what's the pond I'm looking at for talent. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the skills gap, uh, which is real, but it's truly been exacerbated by the fact that uh, demand, employers, are generally looking in very finite pools, which we know won't produce enough four-year college graduates. I don't think there's any prediction that we'll say we're going to have enough four-year college graduates to meet the needs of our businesses. And so the question is, how are we looking at talent? How are we determining who's talented? What proxies are we using for that that may or may not introduce a lot of bias? Uh, you know, I think the interesting statistic is uh, only eight out of 100 Americans over the age of 22 have a four-year degree that they got between the ages of 18 and 22. So 92% of adults do not have a four-year degree that they got through the ages of 18, 22. But if I'm thinking about my college grads and think about four-year, you're really starting to narrow the pond within which you're fishing. And so I think there's a, a lot of things happening on the demand side which are limiting one's ability to see talent. And then on the supply side of the equation, many young adults, especially those who didn't get born into the right zip code, who lost the lottery uh, of zip code in life, uh, aren't actually being prepared well by your existing pathways. Clearly, college, four-year college is not even in the cards for many of those individuals, just due to the cost structure. So you have this market failure that is exacerbating so the So Gerald, tell us gap. more about your organization, because you have a really interesting approach to this. We had, so we work with low-income 18 to 24-year-olds across the country uh, who have a high school degree or a GED, and in one year move them from poverty to a professional career with everyone from Amex, Goldman City, Facebook, Twitter, Google, LinkedIn, uh, you name it, 250 large companies across this country. You know, Amex is taking 300 Java developers uh, from us because they repatriated uh, 1,500 Java jobs in the digital transformation effort in realizing that their cost structure is broken when you try to figure out how do I compete for Java developers coming out of a four-year small <coughs> pond. So we uh, work with low-income young adults who are highly motivated, train them up for six months. They're getting a year's worth of college credit while they do that. Six months, they intern at large companies around the country. Uh, State Street's hired 500 of our uh, graduates into fund accounting. And um, we are a better source of talent into that uh, entry-level professional career path. And everyone from Java, quality assurance testing, cybersecurity, and then we've branched into other areas outside of technology as well, uh, operational, uh, sales and service oriented. Um, that there's huge demand at this middle skill category in a company. So I was talking to Gerald on the phone 
and I happened to mention I was in Atlanta. He said, well, let's uh, just go down the street. We've got an office there. <clears throat> the thing that I was most impressed with with these young adults is these are, uh, these are inner city adults who, as he said, were left out of society, uh, left out of the t typical paths that society has to get you through college. And these people, not only do they skill, learn skills, they learn the social skills. They look you in the eye. They have their, their elevator pitch down perfectly. All the skills that we know are important in office that people might not have picked up just at home, they're learning this as well as the other skills. Uh, I was really impressed. Yeah, the main thing is uh, folks will stay two to four times longer in a job. Right? The average millennial sticks 18 months in a job in many organizations. Our folks are staying two to four times longer uh, in equivalent jobs. And that's, you know, that's your amortizing your acquisition cost over a lot longer if I'm an employer. Cool. And, uh, you know, our most forward-thinking employers are looking more broadly at pathways into their organizations that aren't myopically focused on what higher education and post-secondary education used to look like as opposed to where it's heading over the next 20 years. So if we look at all those jobs that don't require college degrees or all the, all the uh, <laughs> other opportunities out there, this might be a way to get people into opportunities they didn't have before. But let's go with Tom, right? Tom, we keep hearing the robots are destroying the opportunities. Uh, you're a little more optimistic than that, aren't you? A bit, a bit. Um, uh, there are a lot of people who say, you know, half of U.S. jobs will be gone um, soon. Um, I think that's certainly an exaggeration, and nobody knows the exact number. But, you know, increasingly, I, I think we need to think about um, computers as co-workers um, if we're going to be successful um, in our careers and with our talent. And if you think about the attributes of a computer as a co-worker, um, it's not necessarily somebody you'd want to have. They're um, uh, certainly smart and getting smarter at a much faster rate than you are, sorry to say. Um, you, you never want a smarter coworker than you are. They're somewhat <laughs> snobbish in that um, they only want to work with experts. So the entry level workers um, are, I think, in many cases in tough shape. Um, a lot of those entry level tasks they can do already, so the only remaining jobs will be for people who are experts. How do you become an expert if you don't hire any entry-level workers? That's a problem that I think most organizations have yet to resolve. Um, the computers are pretty egotistical in that uh, they insist that you're going to work with them if you're going to be successful. So um, I think the, um, the jobs of the future will largely be working with computers as, as colleagues and uh, people will either be aware of what they're good at and what they're not good at as you would with a coworker um, and kind of step in where they fall short or you know, maybe you could be a computer's boss. There's some pretty good jobs there. You know, I think of hedge fund manager as the archetypal computer's boss. All the trades in a hedge fund are typically done by computer, but somebody's kind of looking at the entire portfolio and how it's working out. And I think that's worked out fairly well for hedge fund managers in terms of their own <laughs> income. And they're pretty hegemonic as co-workers in that they keep taking over um, things that uh, we normally did. I mean, you mentioned the middle skill jobs, but um, there are, uh, if anybody's read Martin Ford's Rise of the Robots, that's a really depressing book, but he talks about um, machines taking over hamburger flipping, which has you know, uh, been the, uh, the great resort of, of um, many workers in the US. And increasingly, they're going after doctor, lawyer, journalist, professor, et cetera, types of jobs as well. So they're a um, tough colleague to have, but I don't think we have a lot of choice about it. It's interesting. My sister teaches at a for-profit law school. It's one of these schools you go to if you can't go anywhere else. And for a long time, they've turned out lawyers. Uh, they turned out lawyers who do the work that no lawyers want to do. And um, unfortunately, the robots uh, are doing all that. E-discovery. E E-discovery, e exactly Document right. And so review. now she's trying to find out where, where are some other ones. They're actually better jobs that are actually really good jobs for people if, if they want to take them. They got, they're getting people into regulatory compliance out of her school, and that's a really good opportunity. But now IBM Watson and others are getting into regulatory compliance. So it is you know, tougher at, at both ends of the spectrum to, to go through. Well, so, you know, so far, I'm not hearing anything happy. So what's the good One good tip for your sister would be um, if she could teach people about lawyers about e-discovery mm -hmm. um, and predictive coding and IBM Watson and all these technologies that are coming into the field, 
she would be really preparing them for their occupational futures. You're not going to find that up the river at Harvard Law School. Um, you, can be, you can be sure of that. No, the terms won't even be mentioned in three years of legal education there. So um, your sister could have a big advantage uh, over some other institutions. Can, can we ask Tom, he said 50% was high uh, of jobs replacement. What's low? Uh, nobody knows exactly, but um, my guess is that we're looking at, you know, 10 to 20 percent um, in over the next 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, computers are also, as a coworker, slow to take over. Um, and one fact I love to cite is um, there were, in 1980, 500,000 bank tellers in the United States. Um, in 2016, there are roughly 500,000 bank tellers in the United States, um, despite ATMs and online banking and so on. So I wouldn't recommend it as a career for anybody. The Bureau of Labor Statistics <laughs> suggests it's going to start moving downhill, but it is slow to, to take over. So, you know, one of the things that came up yesterday, this morning in one of the sessions is this idea of the gig economy, the contract worker, the contingent workers. To what extent are you seeing that? So the people that you're looking for skills, are you looking to hire them internally, or are you doing some of this gig and contract stuff? I'll, yes. I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. So, so at Avnet, what we try and do is we, we deliberately sort of keep a fairly strong force of employees who are there for the long run, who understand the culture and the way that we work, and we think that's very important. We also try and keep um, uh, about 20% of our workforce as contingent or, or contract workers. And our, and our view is, for the employees, we invest in their careers. Um, for the long run, and they know that. Um, and when we go through hard times, it's the contractors or the contingent workers that, that move off. Or when we get projects that come to an end, we don't want to have a layoff at the end of large projects. So, so we want our employees to feel sort of secure, um, and we think that's hard to get with contract folks um, and, and to make that long-term commitment. So, so we, we think this, uh, it's a hybrid model, but, but the employees are the ones that we want to feel confident in their position at the organization. Yeah, I definitely agree with the hybrid. I mean, we're, so we're doing a bunch of test and learn work right now with some of the you know, gig economy freelance type uh, resources, so Upwork and some others, just beginning to figure out you know, what is the right way to use it and how to apply it. And of course, the impact it has on culture and your, your thoughts and theories around compensation and, and management. And so there's a lot of uh, you know, areas of um, impact there that we're going to try to figure out. But I, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting about it from a from an HR standpoint and from anybody who manages talent, uh, so many people are doing both, right? Especially when you look at millennials. And so at Cigna, millennials are now more than 50% of our overall population. And they're also more than 50% of the overall workforce. So most companies seem to have a disproportionate number of millennials either currently a part of the workforce or moving in that direction very rapidly. And most people in that generation don't currently make enough money to afford all of the things that we were able to afford when we started in early jobs. So you know, places to live and cars and all the things. So most of them, more than 38%, I think, or almost 50% at this point, are doing both. So they may do a full-time job by day. They may be tutor.com by night. Um, whatever it is they find interesting. So what, what I have tried to say to people is, what does that mean for you in terms of them being part of your workforce? You know, how long will they be part of the workforce if maybe they ultimately want to pursue this passion that currently is more of a side job, but ultimately may be their full-time job? Or if they're doing this part-time job on nights and weekends, what does that mean for what you used to be able to expect of employees when they would be doing you know, the work for your company during those hours? So there's a lot of issues there that I think that people, when people hear the gig economy or freelance economy, the only thing they think about is, should I have those people as employees, when actually I think there's a far bigger uh, impact on the company and the workers beyond that. And this millennial thing came up, right? The idea, you know, we all, I'm not going to put the labels on, but we all, anybody my age has a viewpoint on what millennials are, and they're different for better or for worse. Um, do you see the millennials that you're training, Gerald, having those same kinds of attributes, or are you seeing them looking more at the long term, the, you know? We, we have millennial age students without millennial attitude. OK. Um, in general. Uh, so you know, our young why adults, is that? Because they uh, have developed a, a high level of grit, resiliency, and the fact is their average income before this job was $5,000. They know what poverty looks like and feels like. And when you get someone paying you $35,000 a year, 
you're bloody grateful. Mm -hmm. You work hard, you show up when others don't, and they, you stay longer. Um, so it's, you know, I think that, that having folks who develop resiliency, if you, see, if you see adversity as a strength rather than a deficit, you can think differently about talent, right? And you know, whether it's Scott Peck and The Road Less Traveled or you know, a lot of folks talk about where do you develop uh, and grow as an individual, it's often not through the easiest of times. So our folks have been through challenges and the fact is they're hungrier, harder, and grittier. And employees want that today. So let's look forward, if, go ahead, yeah. Can I challenge just a little bit there? Sure. So, so I, I, you know, when I think of millennials, I think there is this sort of stereotype, and in some cases it's merited of they're a little picky and choosy and et cetera. I, I gotta tell you, when, when, when I talk to our interns and our sort of graduates who are right in that millennial space, I mean, I find them just as motivated, just as hardworking mm. as, as, as any generation that certainly I've had direct experience with. Um, so where's year, the bad reputation coming from then? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the media, we'll blame the media, everyone no, but does. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to contradict you because I, I think when folks have a tough upbringing and they don't get the benefits of perhaps a professional sort of comp salary, et cetera, that does make you hungry and, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful opportunity to give kids, it, it, by the way. It's a, you could posit that we're the ones who have it wrong, mm. right? I think it's a highly potentially likely outcome that yes sir, no sir, how high sir, at least when I grew up in the 80s of work, actually may not be the path to the greatest level of happiness in well-being uh, as an employee. So it's arguable that the generation of employers is viewing something different, which arguably could be better, right, in looking at life a little more holistically. Uh, and maybe there's a chance for us to be learning as opposed to uh, seeing you should be adapting to the way in which we grew up, many of us, through work, is equally a, you know, a positive one could make. Well, well, let's take the, oh, go ahead, Karen. No, all I was going to say is, I, I mean, I, I think um, Steve really makes a very good point. My, all I remember is every time someone talks about the issues with millennials, I feel my grandmother sitting on my shoulder talking about me, right? I mean, I remember being younger. My grandmother would say to my mother the exact same thing that everybody's now saying about millennials. And so I, I, I don't necessarily know that it's a millennial thing. I think it may just be the youngest generation in the workforce, whoever that may be, gets tagged with a lot of these attributes that are just so different than what we are now accustomed to. But regardless, um, I do think, though, the one last thing that I wanted to say about the gig economy, because I do think this has a big impact on talent, uh, and we're already seeing you know, issues with getting enough, right? So the, the whole um, financing opportunity thing is what really drives me to think about what we should be doing differently. And what I mean by that is, if you can go out there onto Kickstarter and you can raise $50,000 tomorrow to pursue your passion to start your own company, how long is it that most of us could retain our talent if they, if they figure this out and are successful with that. So if people have always dreamed of being X and you can go out and quickly raise enough money to be X, how long will we be able to retain people? Um, and so I think that's what, when I sort of look at the gig economy, I think about those types of things because I think that has an opportunity to really significantly impact our ability to retain people and motivate and incent them far beyond um, you know, other issues. Yeah. You know, earlier today, Fiona Murray talked about how you know, the MIT students don't want to go work for large companies. They really want to go work for the startups and other things because they get the variety, they get the potential upside. And if you're, what you're saying, I guess, is if, if the rest of the market starts acting like that, then it gets tricky. Right. Yeah. Well, so let's look forward now. You know, we, we started talking a little bit about where these skills are going, but what do these skills gaps start looking at like in the future? Tom talked about some of the future skills. You've talked a little bit. What in, if we were to go forward five or 10 years, what are things are you looking for at that point? Tom? Well, you know, I think to um, echo some of the things that came up earlier, um, if you're going to be working closely with a machine, as, as many of us already are, and more of us will over time, I think that combination of understanding um, something about the business domain, uh, being able to communicate it effectively, um, you know, being able to deal well with carbon-based life forms as opposed to just silicon-based life forms, um, and um, being able to understand some degree of the technology, some level of um, ability to understand programming logic. I mean, Bill Gates is saying programming probably won't be done by humans for too much longer, but it's still useful <laughs> to know how it's done. Um, uh, 
that combination, I, I sometimes refer to them as purple people. They're sort of blue and red mixed, and um, some quantitative, some uh, computational, and some you know, business and communication. I think that's still going to be a very important combination of skills you know, over the foreseeable future. You know, when I was doing my digital transformation research uh, the last couple of years, uh, I'd say, you know, what's the hardest skill to find? Is it big data analysts and every, or these kinds of things? And the number one skill I would hear is, I'm finding it impossible to find a charismatic quant. And it sounds like exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Perhaps I, I, it's I, an oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> I got a comment on to Tom's statement then. Uh, it's a long time ago, but when I was studying my computing degree, I can remember a college professor telling us not to bank on being in programming. He mm. said, it's going to get automated in the next few years, et cetera. And, and here we are, something like 30 years later, and, and programmers are still valuable. It, they're different languages, et cetera. But um, I'm not sure that's going to get automated too quickly. I would, I don't know. Bill Gates, I defer to on that topic. <laughs> he's, 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 <laughs> but, but I do have an example to give you, if I may. Okay. Uh, so so um, uh, actually, just, just a couple of months ago, we, we closed down in my company our last COBOL system. So, so uh, does anybody know, anybody know COBOL? Any, come on, with pride. <laughs> so, so um, as we were, this system's been there for 30 years. I've got this really loyal team that, that actually introduced the system 30 years ago, and we were closing down this system. And we, we agonized as a leadership team about what, what do we do with those folks, because um, we don't need COBOL programmers anymore. Uh, so we ended up going to them, and we asked them, and some wanted to be retrained. Um, it's a more mature group, but they wanted to, to, to be retrained, and we're happy to do that. Um, and for the others, we were worried about at that sort of stage in their career what was going to happen to them. And as, they've, as, they've, as, as they make their plans, every one of them is going to walk into a job if they've decided to leave us. There's a shortage of COBOL programmers out there. <laughs> so so they, they haven't taught it for quite a few years, I guess. Cool. So, so mm -hmm. maybe a career opportunity for many, many of us. I mean, you, you wonder so, you have CIOs, obviously, in the, in the community. Um, how do you, it'd be curious to hear, we call ABCs attitudinal, behavioral, and communication skills. And employees generally hire for skills and fire for behavior in, in general. So how do you think about what do you really need in, a, in an individual? And is it ability to learn? Uh, problem solving, critical thinking skills? Is it skills or is it competencies? Uh, how do we assess for competency? really well and authentically, you know, what behavioral interviewing techniques can get at the underlying competency. Because the only thing we know is whatever they're programming in today is not going to be around in some number of years, and it may be replaced by a different language. But the underlying competency probably will only grow in its need. And so how do hirers, how does Karen, which she sounds like she's doing, get really good at authentically assessing one's competency uh, in along with attitudinal behavioral communication skills and saying if we could authentically get at that, we wouldn't need proxies for some of these things like a degree, which is purely a proxy for the underlying competency you want to get at. So I would argue that kind of employers, if they could truly get to authentically assessing competency, you'll get your best workforce out of that. Well, yeah, that's, that is what we're trying to do. So, I mean, we mentioned NAC, but I mean, there's a whole variety of potential tools out there. But what NAC does is it helps to identify the, the tendencies, the characteristics, the competencies of an individual. Um, so it does a couple of things, actually. It helps you understand what really differentiates a high performer from others. So it can really help you put together a role profile. Um, and then it can help you understand individuals in comparison to that role profile. And so if you have somebody who isn't currently a high performer in a certain type of role, it would help you understand what their natural tendencies are, their competencies, et cetera, in comparison to that you know, profile. And then it would give you a source of understanding for how you could develop the individual. And over time, you could, of course, reassess. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it at Cigna exclusively at this point for development purposes. We want to understand what really <coughs> makes the high performer. And then once we know that, we try to understand everybody else and work with them you know, in a growth mindset type orientation to build them into those types of high performers. So that's what we're trying to do more of um, as we go forward. And, and again, you know, my view of it is that all the CIOs that are part of this day today have the power because you are the ones most people look at as the sources of valuable data. 
um, and information. And so the more you can help emphasize the need to do these types of things from a talent standpoint versus simply going with people's opinion or people's instincts, I think the better off we'd all be. So it, it, let's open it up to questions. If you want to line up, I have one more question for the group, and then we'll do the, the, the broader uh, thing. So if you have any questions, just line up at the microphones, and we can go from there. Uh, I, what, one, to them, one topic we haven't necessarily touched on that I really want to is, what does leadership look like in the future in a world of better data, smarter machines, different kinds of people? How are leaders of the future going to be different? Okay, so um, I'll start with just one thought. Um, I'm not going to go into any real detail here because we don't have a lot of time, but. If you haven't read a book called Leaders Make the Future um, by a gentleman named Bob Johansson, I would do that. Um, it's very, very well done. It, it comes up with basically the 10 leadership skills that in his opinion and those promoted by the Institute for the Future would be um, really necessary. And so things like sense making and you know, being able to work in a world of paradoxes, um, it's just really very well done. And when the word leader doesn't necessarily mean a person leading a big team. It could be just an individual that needs to act more in the capacity of a leader. Um, but it's incredibly well done. And to me, what really stands out is it's the ability to think of leadership as a network and to be somebody who can work in a network that can make decisions. So meaning, you don't think you have all the answers. You value the network of, of other you know, thoughts and ideas um, as the source by which you go about you know, having power. Um, and so I think that that's um, particularly interesting. But anyway, that would be my two cents. So what you're saying, Karen, is the skills that come much more naturally to women than to men are the essential <laughs> skills for leaders in the future? Well, that's not exactly <laughs> what I said. But, but George said it. I do agree with it. <laughs> And maybe some of those leadership roles will be automated <laughs> as well. Um, I mean, uh, computers are pretty good at networking the last time I checked. And um, no, there are some people I've been um, talking with a guy from Boston Consulting Group who's written a little bit on sort of, sort of self-driving strategy. And you know, leaders often make some really bad decisions. You know, we know most of the big you know, merger and acquisition decisions don't work out very well. Um, IBM has started to look at merger and acquisition candidates with analytics, so it may be that some of those things we thought were the province of CEOs um, could be the province of smart machines. Well, and I think honestly to just I mean, broaden it, when people say the leader will be more of a network, what's wrong with a few nodes of the network being computer? I mean, I don't think it has to be just groups of individuals. I think smart leaders would incorporate automation as part of that. In, in, in addition, I would argue that if in many of our working lifetimes, we'll work in a majority minority country. And so the ability to actually develop cultural competency uh, as a leader, and are you truly hearing, uh, are you getting the best talent in your organization because you've reduced all conscious and unconscious barriers to prevent the best talent from finding its way into your organization and then being able to lead a pluralistic society? Um, I would have to think in the way this country is going, that's going to be an ascendant skill for leadership. It's interesting you say that because, Steve, one of the things that when we had been talking that came up, and you know, of course we interviewed you for the, the award process, is when we would interview Steve and talk through things, it was never Steve doing it. It was always his team doing it. And it was never that we wanted to do this technology. It was we wanted to build the right skills. And that, that just really impressed me as something that I don't hear from a lot of leaders. But you believe in this strongly. Um, so I'm a big fan of we rather than me or you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the team, teams are powerful, aren't they? If you have, to Karen's point, if you have the right sort of diversity of thoughts, skills, wh whatever the diversity is, that makes for a powerful team in my experience. Um, and I have a selfish interest as well, if I, if I may. <laughs> so you know, if you hire the best and you've got a great team beneath you, boy, that helps with your personal workload as well, I think. So, 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 so big, big, as, as I suspect all of us are, you know, big supporters of the team dynamic, um, but, but, it, but it also dri should drive for excellence and rigor as well. So one of the key roles of a leader going forward might be to develop the right team and let them work their networks or do whatever needs yes. to be done. Okay, cool. Well, let's start over here. Uh, just so briefly, George if, if I might just yeah. make a quick, when we do questions, and this is a ton of food for thought, let's alternate between the microphones. Um, there's, if we could be succinct in our questions, um, and before you ask your question, if you could introduce yourself by name and organization, that'd be great. Good enough. Uh, Gary Beach, former publisher of CIO, columnist now for the Wall Street Journal on tech talent. Uh, briefly, uh, the panel talked about, Steve, you engaging these, these new workers in college. Gerald, certainly familiar with your plan, getting them uh, at high school. 
Uh, but there's a lot of evidence that those seven skills, George, that you referenced, have to be start, start to be taught even at pre-K. So my question to the panel is, how do we systemically reform public education to start teaching those, those skills at a much earlier age? Little question to start, right? Yeah. So anybody want to take that? I'll be here later. You can talk. <laughs> Automation is the answer. Uh, uh, well, you know, I do think that some, you know, not to beat a uh, uh, live horse, but some of the adaptive learning capabilities in schools that are available now, not widely used, could accelerate the um, teaching and learning of the kind of more traditional things that you learn in school, leaving more time for initiative, teamwork, and so on. So I, I think we could compress some of that stuff. It's not very efficient the way it's taught now. And mm -hmm. teachers could focus on the, the acquiring the human skills that, that were on that list. Mm. And, I mean, there's universal probably acceptance at uh, pre-K, universal pre-K makes sense. Yeah, we don't have the political will to actually enact universal pre-K in this country, which is crazy because all the research would say that that's a, a good thing to do. And then we have to recognize that, that in many of our inner cities, we have a greater segregated uh, in lower resourced environment uh, than we had prior to the, the eradication of Jim Crow, that we have, we, we have to recognize the fact that we have many urban areas in this country where we're giving people a crappy education. And again, the political will isn't there to say this is unacceptable. We have to equalize resources going into this. And so, you know, not only are you not getting what you need, but, you know, you, you, your K-12 education in certain places is really, uh, we're allowing that to happen. Yet, at least in this state, you have the best suburban K-12 in the country here in Massachusetts. It's unbelievably good compared to other states, yet our, in, we have the gap between achievement in this, in this state is the highest, second highest of any state in the country. Let's go over this side for a question. So, uh, something struck me both in this and of the, gig, the gig economy discussion this morning. So it seems as if business has really tried to separate itself from society in a lot of ways, and it's become a very transactional relationship with society. And then we complain that we don't have the right workforce. So examples. So um, yeah, we worry that we can't get enough graduate, four-year graduates, but we insist on supporting governors that cut state university funding. Um, you know, we we um, complain that we don't have any, enough people with the right core competences and core underlying behaviors, but we insist that universities treat teach trade capabilities like Java programming rather than underlying computer science, for example. So a, we, we complain that we, you know, our workers have to do side jobs because we're not paying them enough to buy houses or have kids. So it seems that industry has kind of separated itself out from the things that are required to have a functioning skills economy. So the question is, what do we need to do to re-engage industry in a, in a constructive way with these broader policy questions and to ensure this wide pipeline, not just the selfish interest of individual businesses. I'll make a comment or two. So I think, you know, what you're touching on are sort of things of citizen concern to us as opposed to perhaps, they, they are of business concern, but, but many of us look at some of those issues from a, as a citizen, as an individual kind of thing. Um, and I think there is a growing awareness that perhaps we are underinvested in some of these areas or we're being too, too precise about the skill sets that we need. Um, what we do at Avnet is we, we, we engage with the community. So wh whether that's about some of our leaders going into the schools or working with the university system and trying to provide mentor-type relationships and supporting and influencing, um, we, we want to be a part of that debate. We, we're, I think like many enterprises, we're very cautious about getting caught up in something that could be seen as a political debate. So we, 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 we don't want to sort of get too involved there. But behind the scenes, we're happy to sort of be clear about what we need and, and hopefully... Um, support and lobby towards good outcomes. Good, good outcomes for all of our communities, not just for business. Mm. Well, and I think that, um, you know, Steve makes a really good point. Most companies do the types of, you know, we, we try to work in our communities, we try to do what we think is right in order to make things better. Um, but I think it all goes back to um, some of the other points that were made here in the political will comment, which is, you know, right now everybody's focused on whatever the unique activities or items that they think are most important. And it, if we could get more agreement amongst a larger number of companies as to a few bigger problems, mm -hmm. then I think 
you know, you'd have enough capital and enough energy and people to really knock down a barrier and then you could move. But I think the issue right now, and you see the similar issue in my opinion in just general fundraising, say medical issues. You know, there's so many issues and so many dollars being split off into so many directions that it's hard to get enough money and enough people to, to have any of them, you know, put under. Right? And so the Gates Foundation, when they went after malaria with as much money as they went after it with, they'll likely now bury that for good, which is terrific. But I think that, that that's one of the answers has to be, how do you get just a few issues to be the focus of a lot of people's attention versus a lot of issues and just a few people's attention? Yeah. So one of, the, one of the things that, uh, that this leads to, though, is you know, in the universities, we always try to listen to the business community and find those few couple things that are the right places to be training. And actually, about every week now, including at MIT, I hear about another school that's launching a big data analytics program. Over 100 uh, now in the US. Over 100. Yeah. Did we get that right, or are we just behind the curve already, and we're training for the wrong skills? Well, you know, in the short run, I think it's a good idea. In the mm -hmm. long run, I think you know, machine learning is going to create most of the models, but somebody needs to roughly understand how machine learning works so you can shut it off when it stops working well, and <laughs> so on. So, um, and, and I think that requires some, some level of that, that training. Well, I think it goes back to what you mentioned, Tom, which is um, as it relates to uh, programming, right? I think everybody going forward should have some base understanding of programming. That doesn't mean you have the base understanding to be a programmer. It simply means you need a base understanding of how that kind of stuff happens because it does make a difference in your ability to then make sense of other things from there. And I think it's the same with that subject, with data analytics and informatics, I think every employee should have a general understanding of how to make sense of data, how to tell a story from data, how to interpret data, analyze data. But you know, it doesn't mean you need to be a data analytics expert, but you need some amount of that. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the true experts, um, you know, a lot of that's already in motion, so maybe we can try to refine some of these to be more focused at, at everybody else. It, it, you, the thing you mentioned, Karen, is interesting because it's come up at my children's schools right now. Uh, is the programming, yeah. right? So everybody has to learn basic algebra, mm -hmm. although they can get more math. Everybody needs to learn US history and some other things. Should one of the required courses be computers in the public schools? Well, there was even a, like a great TED talk was out on Twitter today, uh, focused on, you know, should we replace calculus in school with statistics? Hmm. Because is calculus really more of an analog world skill and is statistics really more of a digital world skill? And so, you know, those are the kinds of conversations I, but, but it seems as if it takes us, you know, to Tom's point about bank tellers, for whatever reason, you know, people have been having these thoughts for a very long time, but by the time we finally get calculus out of the curriculum and replace it with statistics, it'll be 20 years from now. Yeah. Why? I don't know, but it does. That's because that's what we know what to teach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, We'd have to develop a new thing. course otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, you know, the teachers and university faculty are kind of a drag on progress in that regard. <laughs> Whoops. Cool. So we have another question over here. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan Ruan. I'm a Sloan Fellow here at MIT. Um, so, so far we've mainly been talking about existing organizations and we've, talk, we've really thought about large organizations and how they're going to adapt. But what I'm interested to understand is from a startup point of view, um, is the capabilities that are coming with machine learning and automation so powerful that actually startups could uh, disrupt incumbents simply because they were organizationally designed around the automation capabilities. In other words, if I started a law firm today that was built around the capabilities of AI, could that actually very quickly have a strategic advantage over all other incumbent law firms? Well, my uh, quick answer would be, in the world of healthcare, if you look at a startup by the name of Oscar, which most of you have probably heard of, um, that's exactly what they've done, right? So it's a brand new company, started out with basically automation as the foundation. Um, and um, although they're not huge yet by any stretch, um, they have now gotten the investment from Google, and Google wants them to be the, the premier, basically, promoter or user of all of their healthcare-related technologies. So it, it's just a matter of time before they'll be. But it is interesting to watch some of the startups in a, in a really defined old industry go about it in a very different way with technology as the, as the front, really, versus the back end. Mm. You heard about, if you were around this morning, you heard about Cabbage, which I think is doing a great job of disrupting commercial lending with data and, and analytics. In law, I, don't, I haven't seen any startups like that. It's a really interesting idea. The general counsel of IBM said that he thought Watson could do about 95% of what all of his outside counsel had done for him over the years. So 
That suggests that a startup like the one you're suggesting could be a really good idea. I think the cloud's a great enabler here as well, isn't it? I mean, just the barriers to entry in terms of technology and capacity were, were so great even just a few years ago, whereas now there are services that you can, you can buy into, pay by the drink, et cetera, and, and you, can, you can get that computing power that's needed to support that kind of capability. Yeah. How big companies preserve innovative capacity so it's not, I mean, it's, it's, you're less encumbered as a small company, clearly, and can take advantage and move quickly. But if I'm in a large company, it's got to be a big think around how do you preserve our ability to be innovative, fast, unencumbered by the corporate behemoth and bureaucracy in a way that allows us to not have someone else e eat our lunch. I mean, if I was in a big company, that must be consuming for any CEO. Most CEOs today say they run tech companies, whether it's uh, Under Armour or J.P. Morgan, they would describe themselves as tech companies today, which is interesting, uh, the way in which they're articulating who they are. Yeah, I, th I think the way that like big companies that have existed in workforces, the way they think about automation and unbundling every task is different than if I was to actually start with no employees yeah. mm. and unbundle every task. Totally. It might be different. We're doing some research right now on, on how, how do traditional companies start looking more like digital companies. And one of the things that we see is this mindset that the companies that get this think, tend to think first for technology solutions and then people solutions, as opposed to finding the people solutions and then automating them later. Uh, and I think that's one of the things you're getting at there. So uh, we have time for one more question. Let's. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, Evan Ryan from a human-centered design firm based here in Boston called Fresh Tilled Soil. I'm curious. We've talked a lot about technology and business as the skill set, and we kind of focused on those two things. I'm curious to know. What do you think about design and creativity and how that fits into the value systems that we're building with our organizations? Well, so as part of Cigna's um, base learning and development uh, type offerings, we, we integrate design thinking. So as a matter of fact, I just got a note yesterday from one of my team members who's participating and leading a design thinking um, experience. And they were down in the Cigna cafeteria interviewing people that were in the coffee line for some idea that they had um, in order to make it a more customer-centered design. So we're big, big, big believers and proponents of how to put design thinking at the front of what we do and how we do it. Um, just probably started the past year or so. Um, so not experts by any stretch, but definitely see the, the wisdom and the value in it. The thing that I see a big need for, and there's not nearly as much knowledge about it as there ought to be, is um, sort of, you might call it digital design thinking. How did we develop um, digital products and services much faster and more effectively. And the companies that do it well um, have a lot of people thinking and talking about it, but there's not a whole lot of science behind it. You know, kind of lean startup is about as much um, orientation to that issue. Minimum, everybody talks about minimum viable products. Um, I think we, we need to learn a lot more about digital product and service design and get that into you know, design thinking oriented programs. And not only for the customer, but for the employee. Mm -hmm. How do you create jobs that are uh, both uh, effective but also enjoyable? You know, especially look at the, you know, the, the millions and millions of Americans who work in, whether it's retail or fast food, and yes, some will get automated, but how, does, how do we think about are those jobs ones that won't just churn and burn you know, work as after work, or as opposed to how to create uh, jobs that are both enjoyable as well as productive and effective. Thank you. So, uh, so we have about two minutes left, and uh, what's nice about the two minutes is that you know it's MIT, so we have to give a final exam. And so each of the panelists have a final exam that they have to answer. And the question is, um, we have a lot of CIOs in the in the group here, and we've been talking kind of this wide ranging discussion about skills, uh, but the question is. What one piece of advice would you give to a CIO about how to develop the right skills for the future in their unit and in the organization? But given also that it's MIT, you only get one sentence to answer. So why don't we go down the line here? I just want you to know, I went to DePaul. It was much easier to do the final exam, I'm sure, than here at MIT. <laughs> so, um, so I would go back to something that I've now said twice. So I guess they say repetition uh, gets it to sink in. I would have it be for the CIOs to be the advocates of data-based talent decisions. Um, and so that would be my ask. Steve? Um, I'll build on that sort of team theme that we discussed earlier on. I, I would say hire the best and trust your people. 
I'd say think differently about talent, uh, where it resides, and how you access it. This is one sentence, but it has a subordinate clause. You, you already used your whole uh, sentence, yeah. Uh, it's been automated. Uh, can you plan, tell he's a professor, too? Plan for <laughs> augmentation, not automation. Um, think of smart people working together with smart machines. Okay. Well, thank you. Please uh, thank the, the, the panel for a wonderful discussion.